We're going to speak on this topic here, Evolution Showstopper. Uh, this is a, a talk that was given by Dr. Laclama at the uh, regular apologetics forum meeting on Friday evening, March the 22nd. And uh, due to some technical difficulties, we were not able to record that properly. So this time, we're going to take another run through, and it will be recorded live streaming as well as uh, It'll appear on the website as a copy. So with that, uh, I'm going to speak on this topic, Evolution Showstopper. And uh, what that is all about is on this slide here, uh, our, our second slide in the um, uh, PowerPoint slides here, um, I'm going to give you, if we, we can get to that, uh, the actual presentation here. We're going to talk about uh, where does life come from? First life. Where does it come from? Uh, the Bible gives us one picture of how life came to be, uh, but the evolutionist and atheist would say a life came from natural random chance processes. And we'll look at tonight, uh, is that possible? And then I'll, I'll go give you a few introductory slides on science and topics related to that, just to give us some background information to the talk that we're going to do here. Uh, I'm going to make a distinction between these three concepts of chance, necessity, and design, uh, because they explain everything that we see in this universe. And the, the talk that I'm going to give tonight is on the origin of first life. And uh, the big picture of, of evolution, we see three origins. Origin of the universe, origin of first life on Earth, and then origin of diverse life, which is really uh, all about Darwinian evolution. So the question we ask then is, what about the origin of first life by natural processes? Can that really occur? And we're going to look at five reasons why we don't think that is possible from a science perspective. And these are the four uh, things that we're going to look at. Um, and uh, the law of biogenesis, forming the, the initial components of life, look at the law of mathematical probability and what it says about the possibility of first life coming to be through natural processes. And the fourth, where does information come from? because as we'll see, life requires information. And then we'll draw the, some conclusions to that. So first of all, what's the biblical view of the origin of life? Well, it's very clear, if you know the Bible, in the first chapter of Genesis, uh, the word kind appears 10 times. God says that all life was created by him. He spoke all life into existence. And he talks about kinds. Every kind was created, created separately. And uh, kind should not be uh, equated with species. It's different from species, but the word kind is very important because we then we look at dog kinds, cat kinds, cow kinds, uh, human man, uh, humankind, and uh, those are different kinds. And uh, what do we see as evidence for that in nature? atheist viewpoint, or the evolutionist point of view, uh, is this, according to Darwin, that all living creatures are related through common ancestry. Uh, that the, all life came from one living cell. And uh, the diverse life came to be from that living cell through mutations and natural selection. And that's really by means of random chance processes of nature. So we're going to ask the question, where did that happen? Could it really happen into, in the primordial soup that Darwin uh, um, projected that it could? And, and that's basically the story of evolution's view of how life came to be. And uh, I show you some of the, uh, the steps involved in evolution. Um, but I, I think you know that uh, pretty well. 
So the story of evolution, the step, go, the origin of the universe, origin of Earth, prebiotic pre soup, this is conjectured, of course, and then the first life, first living cell, uh, and then all the different kinds of diverse life that we see on Earth, and finally resulting in humans. So that's the atheist view. Uh, I want to define one important term here. Uh, secular scientists claim that every physical, um, all physical matter can be explained in terms of matter and energy. It's a belief that claims that physical matter is the only or fundamental reality and that all organisms, processes, and phenomena can be explained as manifestations of interactions of matter. In other words, our brain is just a result of interactions of matter and energy, supposedly. Then I wanted to just um, distinguish between two different kinds of science. Um, First of all, operational science, which we know as the scientific method. You know, one postulates the theory, makes observations, and then either proves or falsifies the theory. We are familiar with that methodology in science. But there's another science we have to be aware of, and that is origin science. Uh, because that deals with things that happened at the beginning. We weren't there to observe it, so how do we determine whether any theory is correct or not, because we can't repeat the experiment, but then we come to forensic science. In other words, um, think of it like a, trying to solve a crime. Today, uh, in a murder case, for example, uh, the detectives will look at the DNA of the suspect and find out, um, determine whether it's possible that this person, uh, you know, uh, committed this crime. And we have to do the same thing with origins. You know, when we think about origins in terms of either creation or evolution, both of them are belief systems, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, because observational science, you know, can be done in the present because experiments are repeatable and observable, and that's what we call science. All scientists know that to be so. But then if things happened in the past and are not, obviously not repeatable, but there is an eyewitness account, then that we, we call history and we depend on the credibility of the historian who observed the event and recorded that. And then finally we come to the third, and that is belief system. Uh, this we have to apply to events that happened in the past that are obviously non-repeatable and there were no eyewitnesses to record that at all. And that's what we refer to, of course, as a uh, belief system. And in that sense, both evolution and creation are belief systems, uh, because we weren't there to observe either one of those. And then another concept I want to just uh, uh, summarize here, because it's very important when we come to determine what caused you know, what is the cause of everything that we see in this room, uh, everything we see in the universe, everything we see in living matter? And it turns out to be everything can be explained by one of these three concepts, chance, necessity, or a law of nature, uh, or design. If you look at these four presidential statues on the Mount Rushmore, you know, obviously you'll agree that didn't happen by chance. It's not the way the rain fell on the, on the rock face there, or any other random chance process. That was obviously uh, designed by an artist and then sculptured out on the mountain face. And that did not happen by a law of, of uh, nature. Uh, we think of the law of gravity as a law of nature. Uh, if I step off the platform here, put my foot over the platform, which, the, which way do you think I'm going to go, up or down? 100% down. It always goes down. Gravity always works, and that's why it's called a law. And if it's not one of those two, then it's got to be design. Even something as simple as one of these chairs standing here, they didn't form because matter fell from the ceiling and formed that, that chair just by random chance processes. Somebody designed the, the chair, and an artisan built that chair. That 
involves design. So when we look at evolution, we have to distinguish between three different stages. And the cosmic evolution, that is the beginning of the universe, where did the universe come from? And that includes uh, stars and planets, ga galaxies, clusters of galaxies, solar systems, planets, and elements uh, uh, as well. All of that must be uh, come through evolution or have been created. The second part of that is biochemical evolution, and that is the first life. How did first life appear on the Earth? Did that come about by random chance processes? Is that even possible? Uh, that's called abiogenesis, where biogenesis means a life from life. Abiogenesis means life from non-life. And then third, a part of this chain is biological evolution, organic evolution, and that is evolution from a common ancestor from the first living cell. And we sometimes refer this to this as molecule to man, macroevolution. So of those three things, we're going to look at the middle one, the formation of life from, uh, from nature. And uh, so how could that happen? Uh, the Greeks came up with this law of, of uh, uh, abiogenesis, actually. That's, they said, well, life could form from non-life uh, spontaneously. It can just happen. They had no evidence, but they just surmised that that could happen. So that Greek philosophy was with us for a few thousand years. And then in the 1600s to the 1800s, some scientists got serious about checking this out. Can life really start from non-life um, through natural processes? And uh, these four scientists uh, uh, conclusively determined that it's impossible to form life from non-life. They ran experiments. Spontaneous generation of, of uh, life has never been observed or shown to be possible. And this was proved uh, by uh, Pasteur, finally, conclusively, in 1864. <clears throat> and that's where we come up with the, the uh, life of biogenesis. In nature, life comes only from life and that of its kind. So th there's been hypotheses since then. <coughs> Possibly there is some way of forming it. And we'll look at uh, to see whether that is possible. <coughs> First of all, let's look at some important milestones. Uh, Darwin came up with the uh, his Origin of Species um, book in 1859, and five years later, Pasteur came up with his experiment saying that. Uh, Abiogenesis is just impossible. <coughs> 1953, Miller's experiment was an attempt to show that it's possible to produce the elements of living material through experimentation if we can just uh, duplicate the surmised atmosphere of early uh, Earth. And we'll talk about that experiment in the same year the uh, DNA double helix was discovered. And these are the, you know, the internal elements of our cells, our body cells, that make life possible, that makes us tick. Werner uh, van Git, he came up with the information theory, and um, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, towards the end. So then spontaneous generation, is that possible? It's based on natural philosophy. Uh, life can be continuously created by chance events. Uh, life comes from non-life. That's a biogenesis pro promoted by Greek philosophers for thousands of years. And I said Pasteur put that uh, conjecture to, to rest in 1864. And he came up with the law of biogenesis. That was the year it was established. A brief look at his experiment. <coughs> he, 
He uh, used a broth without contamination, and now there's no living material in that flask, and uh, created a closed environment, kept out dust and particles, and then uh, observed that over the, or the following weeks, and there was no life formed in that at all. And that's a very simple synopsis of the experiment, but uh, that really uh, was the start of the law of biogenesis, which has never been disproved since. So that's number one. Number two, can we really form the components of life from non-living uh, material, from non-living molecules that could be in some primordial soup, for example? Somehow all those pieces got together and uh, formed a living material that turned into a living cell that could then be uh, replicated. Well, life consists of basically proteins, which are chains of amino acids. Our body contains 25,000 or so different kinds of proteins. Um, so our life depends on that. And then another major component is DNA. And that holds the information in the cells. It holds not just the information, but all the programs that are required to duplicate our cell and just make life possible. And then there's RNA, which is a simplified version of DNA. It's not double-stranded, it's a single strand, and it is used, uh, it has instructions to building proteins. And I'll show that in a picture coming up here. And uh, then there, there has to be a catalyst for a transcription. In other words, how do you tell the RNA to produce the, the protein? There must be a program to do that. So there, there's got to be a program to, to be able to do replication. Cells require membranes around them to protect them. If they weren't there, uh, cells wouldn't exist. So what we have here is a chicken and egg problem because DNA is required to build proteins, but proteins require DNA to make them. How can that be, one would ask. So before I get to uh, the experiment here, I'm going to show you a short video clip uh, from ICR. And uh, that will talk about the possibility of some of this happening by chance. What's one of the biggest problems for evolution? The origin of the first cell. Though the cell is the basic building block for life, its design is actually very complex. We could compare the functions of a cell to those of computers, building projects, and even whole cities. Coordinated machines within the cell access vital information in the cell's DNA. Certain protein machines transfer that information at just the right times and amounts to RNA molecules and others use some of that information as blueprints to build more proteins. So it takes a protein along with DNA and RNA to make a protein. Could random evolutionary events explain the origin of this three-way interdependent process? Some believe that the first cell arose spontaneously from a warm pond of chemicals, but attempts to produce simple biomolecules from supposed early Earth environmental soups have produced nothing even close to the array of complicated chemical machinery that functioning cells use. These experiments keep running into a stubborn fact. Natural processes tend to destroy the hardware of life rather than craft it. What about the software, the programming inside cells? Evolutionary scientists shifted their attention to DNA, codes that tell cell parts what to do and when and where to do it. But biological codes are more complicated than computer codes. The true origin of life must account for the complex information programmed into the cell that directs protein machinery to do things like make more proteins. So we can be certain that just like the most complex computers had designers, the cell also had a designer the divine engineer who created all things. Okay. So, so that was back now to the uh, slides here. Uh, is it possible to form the components of life which I just described? And you can see by that video that that, uh, you know, there's no way to explain that from a natural 
set of random chance processes. So then we come to the Miller experiment, and this was uh, done in 1953. It was an attempt to show that the components of life could, be, could have formed in a primordial soup if it contained the right molecules that could then be combined into a living cell. And so they conjectured what the early Earth's atmosphere may have looked like, what gases were contained in that, and uh, whether it contained oxygen or not was very important. So they came up with an um, environment without oxygen, ran this experiment where the uh, boiling water and uh, the, the uh, gases that were combined as the, uh, um, an estimate of what was in the early atmosphere, electrical shock was sent into that, and over a number of weeks actually it took, it produced some amino acids. And uh, voila, it shows that we can do it, right? Amino acids. And uh, yes, it did produce the amino acids, but it didn't produce the right amino acids for life. And if you read your textbook about the Miller experiment, you'll see uh, that they skipped that part of it. And in fact, the other thing is, uh, you notice they have to remove some tar some elements from this uh, experiment over time because otherwise the amino acids couldn't exist. So it is rather a contrived environment that they came up with and uh, their conclusion they, they drew, of course, well, look, we can form components of life, we formed amino acids, but the, it turns out that you have, if you have oxygen in the early atmosphere, it prevents vents the formation of amino acids. If there is no oxygen in the atmosphere, ultraviolet rays will destroy amino acids. So either way, if there's oxygen there or not, doesn't matter, can't happen. And as I said, it produces a mixture of left-handed and right-handed amino acids. Uh, amino acids come in two forms, left-handed and right-handed, just like our hands and uh, it produced about 50% of each in a natural environment. However, there's a low concentrations of the products that were produced, and there are more contaminants than useful products that, um, in the, as a result of the experiment. And remember, the experiment was designed. This wasn't a, a normal, natural environment. So then people started to come up with, uh, scientists started to come up with, well, maybe origins of life could have started in other places. Maybe it, it couldn't have started in early Earth. Maybe there's a, uh, the right environment in different places, like at the bottom of the sea, in hydrothermal vents, active volcano springs, or life on clay. And uh, that has been, uh, may have come the closest to producing some components, but still not the right components. And then if it can't start in life, well, maybe it started in some other planet, maybe it started in space, maybe it was carried to um, humans by some, or, or to Earth by some uh, accidental process. Uh, and if not, perhaps some intelligent um, aliens out there in space produced, transported living material to our planet and directed the start of living matter. Well. That's all conjecture. It's never been shown, never experimentally shown to be true. Here's what some scientists have to say about the origin of life. Is that even possible? Uh, Dr. Yoki says, a scenario describing the genesis of life on Earth by chance and natural causes, which can be accepted on the basis of fact and not faith, has not yet been written. We don't know how it might have happened. How about a self-replicating organism? Is that possible? You know, can you create a cell that would replicate itself by random chance processes? And here, Dr. Orgel, who was a very important researcher in the origin of life, he said, I must admit that attempts to reconstruct this evolutionary process are extremely tentative. None of these attempts have worked. And so we have to conclude there's no way that natural life uh, could have come from non-living material. So then we have to ask the question number three, could life have formed from non-life just by chance? Think of uh, some silly 
um, analogy is like, what's the probability of an explosion in a junkyard, which had all the parts of cars in the yard, some explosion uh, just caused all these parts to come together, and voila, here we have a working car. Is that possible? I think you all say that's impossible. Uh, and cars aren't composed of that many elements uh, like our living cell. So what about the probability of a protein coming into chance by chance? What would that require? A simple protein. Let's look at that. So again, we go back to the basics, say amino acids, there are, about, there are a few thousand types of amino acids, right-handed and left-handed, so thousands of them. Proteins are the building blocks of life, we all agree. They are large organic molecules, and they contain hundreds or even thousands of amino acids in a very specific order. And they have to be in the specific order, or it couldn't be living material. And the important thing that life consists of only 20 different left-handed amino acids. So when, the, when Miller's experiment produces both left and right-handed amino acids, you know, that doesn't work. You need only left-handed amino acids and only 20 specific ones from all these thousands. And if you take one part, one amino acid out of that sequence, it doesn't work. It's not a working protein. If you put another one in, it doesn't work. So it just, you change the sequence of two of them, it doesn't work. So what's the probability of forming one protein? Just by mathematical probability, looking at that. Let's take an example of 200 parts, line up all those amino acids in a very specific order, and try a different alignment let's say a billion times per second, if that was possible, assume 20 billion years of time, and the probability of doing that is z essentially zero. One in 10 to the power of 356. 10 with 356 zeros after it. And we have to realize there's only 10 to the power of 80 atoms in the whole universe. Anything less than one in 10 to the 50th is regarded as zero probability. It just can't happen. And you can see this number 10 to the power of 356 is much, much, much smaller than possible. So living organisms contain many more than 200 parts. Human beings, for example, we have 75 trillion cells in our bodies. And they are very complex. What about what's the simplest life that could be formed. And remember, in Darwin's day, the cell structure was not understood. So Dar Darwin knew nothing about the internal elements of a cell. The sm we know today that the smallest bacteria uh, consists of only 500, well, only all of 580,000 DNA base pairs, or we we'll call them letters. 580,000 base pairs. The probability of forming that by chance is zero. No way, Jose. How about the human genome? Well, it has three billion DNA base pairs. What's the probability of that? Obviously, you can't form the simplest living um, organism, the small bacteria. You're not gonna be able to form the human genome by chance. And remember, here the cell consists of many different components, which are listed here, and these are just part of them. It contains, of course, of a, a nucleus, chromosomes, proteins, RNA, DNA, and a membrane, very importantly. Uh, we have 75 trillion of these in our bodies. So looking at mathematical chance, you're all familiar with uh, uh, you know, throwing heads and, and tails for a coin. Uh, what's the chance of getting two heads in a row when you throw coins? One in four, three heads, one in eight, and so on, down to a thousand heads in a row, and the probability of getting one head in all those thousand throws is only one in 10 to the power of 300. 10 with 300 zeros after it. And you know how impossible that is. It's just impossible, not even, uh, Possible. It's impossible. The law of prob probability states 
and one in 10 to the 50th is mathematically impossible. So you can just see, relating it to coins, that the kinds of mathematical probabilities we're talking about here. So now let's take that to life, probability of forming life from uh, non-life. <clears throat> if we just take a single protein, one in 10 to the power of 240, which you might have up to 400 amino acids in a specific sequence, a single cell, as you see on the right uh, bottom picture here, uh, consists, the probability of forming that by random chance process is a small number like one in 10 to the power of 40,000. 40,000 zeros after that 10. So that's the probability of forming that cell is definitely zero because, again, the number of atoms in the universe is only 10 to the power of 80. The mathematical probability that says anything less than 1 in 10 to the 50 is mathematically impossible. So here's a scientist, a mathematician from the UK. He admits, and he came up with this number of 40,000 knots. You know, and he concludes from that since life cannot be formed by random chance processes, they must therefore have been the product of purposeful intelligence. There must have been some design behind that. So that brings us to number four. And that is to say that life requires information. Um, evolutionists will say the universe consists of on, only two material entities. We mentioned that at the beginning of this lecture, mass and energy. And if you remember Einstein's equation, you know, energy can be converted into mass and mass can be converted in energy back and forth. But everything can be explained in terms of those two entities. But in reality, we know today, there's a third entity involved and, and it, that is a non-material entity and that is information. So life consists of mass plus energy which is material, things we can, uh, we can touch and feel, and then information is details, an entity that we cannot see. Information in life is encoded in the DNA of all plants and animal cells, and we know that from science today. From a definition point of view, I just want to make this clear and then show some examples of that. Information has four components. Uh, parts. One is the code, the alphabet of the uh, English language, for example, the meaning, which can be words, the action, which can be a sentence, and there's a purpose for that sentence. Think of those four things as we go through these next uh, few slides. So information, attributes, these four. Code, in the case of the English language, it's the alphabet and the numbers that we can use. DNA and, and life is DNA. Um, meaning, you can only get meaning by, f by putting the alphabet letters into words. And if they're in certain specific sequence, they are meaningful words. And then you put those words together and you get an action or a sentence. And that sentence must have a purpose. And when you convey uh, information from a sender in the bottom chart here, to a recipient, it must be something that the recipient can understand. Um, I can speak a word in Dutch, but if my recipient doesn't understand the Dutch language, it's meaningless, it's not really useful information. So the definition we come up with, information is an encoded, symbolically represented message conveying expected action and intended purpose. That's the scientific definition we come up with for information. So let's look at the nature of information. And I'll, I'll give you some examples. Uh, the inkwell in the top left there, if somebody spills the ink on a piece of paper, what do you come up with? You don't come up with any letters of any alphabet that would be recognizable. You come up with a big mess of blobs of ink on a piece of paper. That's not information. We can form information from an alphabet uh, down below, the English uh, alphabet of those 26 letters, and, uh, and of course numbers. 
you can use those to form useful information. You have an example in the top right-hand corner, and of course this depends on the recipient being able to read script. Otherwise, it's meaningless information. Then in the bottom, uh, the, this sand dune, or the beach on, on an ocean, it may, you may come across these letters in the sand. They all write in sand. Do you think they happened randomly? Some, uh, it's the way the waves ran up on the shore, and that came up with these words, and voila, hey, guess what? We can read it. I don't think you'd believe me if, if that was true. But that's a very simple example of letters that have meaning. And uh, so clearly, you'll conclude, and that couldn't have happened by a law of nature that requires an intelligent mind to put that information in the sand. So there's design involved there. So let's look at this in more detail. In terms of writing, as I said, we, we have four components again, letters, numbers, and uh, meaning comes in words, and those words have to be, uh, have letters in a certain sequence so they are meaningful. And then you can form a sentence with a verb which contains words uh, that have meaning. And then the result, there's a purpose or design behind that. And I give you one example at the bottom here, which you can relate to. We refer to that sentence that consists of words that you understand they convey information, and, uh, but uh, what's important to note is those words, each word is understandable, and uh, the letters in each word are in a certain order, so they are understandable, and the words are put together into a, a sentence, so they are understandable. But this has the notion of complexity. And, those, and specified complexity, because the letters are in a specified order to give it meaning. But then, uh, going back up to complex but unspecified, if you see this uh, sequence of letters down below there, N-E-O-J and ending in N-U-J, does that convey information? There, yes, there's letters there, but are they in a specific order that gives a meaning? Is there any meaning to those words? No. Uh, does it convey any action? Is there a sentence with a verb? We don't know. Is there any purpose? We don't think so. That's what we refer to as unspecified complexity. And they don't, do not convey information. So we need letters, words, and sentences to convey information. And that information can only be created by some intelligent mind. We know that from experience. So then what about information in computers? Well, information in computers is stored in zeros and ones. Uh, if I look at the zeros and ones, can I make any sense out of that? No. However, they make sense to a programmer. A programmer can write a computer program and uh, using uh, compilers to generate those zeros and ones. And uh, y if you look down below at a program, you can see that, that for a programmer, that makes sense. He can understand what those uh, sentences convey. And that translates into zeros and ones on the disk. And as I say, information is non-material. And uh, one example uh, of um, how to look at that is look at that disk there we know the disk contains the information of zeros and ones. If I wipe the disk clean, in other words, wipe out all the ones and make it all zeros, you think that disk will weigh anything different? No, same weight. And why is that? Because information is immaterial. And you can think of that in all examples that we come up with here. Uh, if we look at information in living systems, and that information is, you can think of as in the D DNA, which is the molecule of life, and you see the complexity of the cell there, that's where the information is stored. And uh, life uh, living systems consist of these cells. And in, uh, in DNA, we talk about base pairs, so you'll see in the top left here, base pairs, the T and the A, 
and then the C and the G, those are called base pairs. And so DNA consists of those base pairs. And in the right, you can see a computer printout with those, uh, uh, those letters A, T, and C, and G. And they consist of the, uh, the sum of the information in that cell. And if I were to print that uh, out for any one cell, you'd come up with uh, about a thousand different books in a library to contain all that information. So it is very complex information. And that's information of living cells. And that's used to replicate the cell. Um, if, for example, uh, one way to look at is living uh, organisms starts with the one living cell that duplicates into two identical cells, four, eight, 16, and 32, and so on, all identical cells. And then all of a sudden, the, st the cells duplicate, but they turn into diverse cells. You know, our bodies it consists of uh, bone cells, uh, eye cells, blood cells, uh, hair cells, you have it. So at some point, uh, those identical cells turn into these different kinds of cells. And there must be a program in the, in the DNA in that cell to say when that should happen. Because if it hand, uh, happened randomly, you can imagine what the result would be. Now, information is stored in machines. And uh, you, know, you look at the, the assembly line here, um, you'll say, well, th that assembly line was put together, had to be put together by an intelligent agent. Somebody designed the assembly line, somebody designed the cars that were produced on that assembly line. Look at the motor below. Uh, that is not going to happen by chance. That required an intelligent agent to design that motor and then uh, other sense to build that motor and all the different components, including the integrated circuit at the bottom right that also requires uh, intelligent agent because those are components of our computers. Well, what about our body? Uh, you may not know, but our bodies actually contain molecular machines. And on the right there, you'll see something that looks like a gear. Uh, and you'll see uh, uh, your rings and statters there, and they actually rotate. They, the propeller, the filament up to the right, they, they actually rotate in your, in your cells at up to 10,000 uh, rotations per second, and they can change direction on a dime, so to speak. And each cell has a few hundred of these motors in them. Fortunately, you can't feel them, but they're there. They make your body work. And I, I want to come back to this term of complex uh, uh, specificity. Uh, we have the term irreducibly complex, which Dr. Behe came up with. And the easiest way to think about that is to think about the, uh, the mousetrap in the bottom right. We know that the mousetrap consists of five different parts. And uh, if one of those parts was removed, you think that that mousetrap would catch any mice? None. All, the point is that all five parts need to be there to make the mousetrap work, to make it functional. <clears throat> then a little bit about the nature of programs. You know, in, an op in a computer, consists of hardware, the disk and the CPU, and uh, at the lower layer, it, can, it contains system software, which we would call the operating system, like Windows or Unix. And then on top of that, it has application software, different application programs that make the uh, computer do things for you. These PowerPoint slides, for example, are projected from a computer that's running a PowerPoint uh, program. And uh, you can understand that that PowerPoint program uh, and these slides weren't put together by random chance. There was intelligent minds, uh, hopefully behind the design of the computer and uh, the slides that I'm showing here. So the programs in the cell uh, do this. 
I mentioned before that uh, the building of uh, the components of life is DNA, RNA, and proteins. And there's processes that need to happen. Transcription, for example, a ribosome, which is the, think of it as a, manu as a uh, factory where things are manufactured and that uh, produces proteins, for example. And remember, proteins are required as part of that in order to make DNA. And it's, and, uh, it's shown on the right here, the different parts, the DNA strand, transcription, RNA, translation into a protein on the right. And it's, it's interesting to note that even Bill Gates, who, as you know, is the founder of Microsoft and uh, came up with the Windows uh, um, operating system and applications that are run on top of that, uh, he admits that the human D DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. A very true statement. And uh, so, uh, you know how complicated computers are in the programs. You can imagine the complexity of living organisms in our body. So again, evolution uh, so, uh, presupposes that everything can uh, consist of mass and energy, but we know there's a non-material entity required, and that's information. And information is encoded within the DNA, RNA, of all plant and animal cells. Life consists of material and non-material information with these four components, which we discussed before. And so, the, the, let me back up to this in a minute. Information in a living system, you know, it's uh, provided in the DNA with just 20 left-handed amino acids and the concepts which are important to understand that these systems exhibit specified complexity. In other words, the, the amino acids and the proteins have to be in a very specified order. And it needs to contain all the parts in order to work uh, in the subsystem. That's called irreducible complexity. So naturalistic mechanisms, undirected causes do not explain the origin of the complexity that we see in living material. Intelligent design constitutes the best explanation for the origin of specified complexity and irreducible complexity in biological systems. Evidence, you know, biology, uh, we see the presence of complex and functionally integrated machines that cast doubt on Darwinian mechanisms of self-assembly. And uh, molecular biology, the presence of information encoded in the DNA molecule has suggested the activity of a prior designing intelligence. There's just no other way to explain it. So living matter and information, here's two quotes, one from an evolutionist who admits, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. We don't know. Scientists don't know. They can't explain it. Werner Gitt, who is a creationist and a German scientist, information scientist, said, there's no known law of nature, no known process, no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. In other words, random collection of molecules getting together there's no way it can form information by chance. Information requires an intelligent agent for its design. So life requires information. And here's the different components. Uh, life, mass, and energy, uh, which is material. Information, which is non-material. Life requires information. Uh, that's stored in DNA. It requires machines, too, as you can see in, our, in the, our body. It requires programs, because programs are needed to replicate the cells. And it requires complexity in terms of irreducible complexity, and that all the parts need to be there, and specified complexity to give it meaning. And then all this requires an intelligent mind. There's no way 
that life can come from non-life by random channels. Our experience tells us uh, that it requires an intelligent mind. And let me just show you another um, video here which will capture some of the things that we talked about. Moment in time when there was no life of any kind. How did life on Earth begin? Where do we start? I mean, there are dozens of theories. And you find you've got this wild diversity of viewpoints, many of which are mutually contradictory. To even begin to try to crack the mystery, you have to supply assumptions about what must have happened in the distant past. There's no direct evidence because no one was there to witness the event and there's virtually no fossil record. What we never observe, ever, is non-living chemicals forming a cell. So in a sense, we have a field of research where the important action has already happened. The primordial history of Earth is indeed an incomplete narrative. Yet despite an absence of physical evidence, most scientists believe that life started when energy sparked non-living matter in the planet's oceans, crust, and atmosphere to create building blocks for the first self-replicating cell. When you come to the origin of life, the rules, and this isn't the science itself, this is the underlying philosophy, the rules say to solve the problem, you can use matter and energy and natural law, natural regularities and chance processes, but that exhausts your toolkit. What you're not allowed to use fundamentally by the rules, so-called rules of science, is mind or intelligence. If you had to attach a name to this position, you can't do better than scientific materialism. A philosophy that tells you the only acceptable explanation has to be rendered in terms of matter and energy. And if you can't solve the problem using those tools, you're not allowed to change the rules. So from that perspective, how did life come to be via matter and energy alone? Now, try to solve the problem. All life that has ever existed on Earth is composed of cells and clues to their origin are woven throughout a network of molecular machines. Enclosed within a modern eukaryotic cell, complex biological mechanisms carry out their work while suspended in liquid. Each of these machines is lifeless, but together they empower growth, movement, metabolism, and reproduction, the vital functions of life. Every component in the cellular factory is made of large compound molecules, and the most numerous are proteins. Functionally diverse, proteins are engineered to unwind and copy genetic information in a strand of DNA, trigger chemical reactions with their hand and glove shapes, control the passage of electrolytes and nutrients through the cell membrane, and tow containers filled with cargo over scaffolds, also made of proteins, that auto-assemble and extend to wherever they are needed in the cell. Magnified 500,000 times, a red blood cell contains 280 million hemoglobin proteins, each designed to carry oxygen. By isolating one of them, we discover that every protein is built from hundreds of smaller molecules called amino acids. 20 different types of amino acids are found in living organisms. The distinct chemical structure of each molecule allows the formation of more than 100,000 different types of proteins. Construction begins when select amino acids are organized into a chain it's a process often compared to arranging alphabet letters into meaningful words and sentences. 
If these individual building blocks are sequenced correctly, the chain folds into a protein fully equipped to perform its task within the cell. But if the amino acids are arranged in the wrong order, the chain won't fold and is eventually destroyed. The simplest living cell contains at least 300 different types of proteins and the biological machinery necessary to grow, reproduce, convert energy, store and process genetic information, and protect its contents from the outside world. Similar components and functions were also required in the first living cell. Now let's apply this basic chemistry to a familiar theory for the origin of life. Scientists have long speculated about primordial oceans loaded with amino acids that floated around like bumper cars. Perhaps some of these random collisions produced a chain long enough to fold into a protein. Later, more amino acids linked it to more chains that folded into even more proteins. Simultaneously, other complex molecules, including nucleic acids, fats, and sugars, also assemble themselves into essential components. Then, without foresight or direction, just the right combination of molecules somehow came together in this chemical soup to form a membrane that encased all of the specific machines required for a self-replicating cell. And there you have it, life from non-living matter. You know, it all sounds so reasonable. The problem is, on the early Earth, the internal complexity required to survive it all would be overwhelming because life as we actually know it is characterized by molecular machines and lots of them. And if you take away that essential hardware, the cell ceases to be. Because there comes a point when you can't get any simpler and still exist. Below that means death. One sometimes hears the criticism, you can't take modern cell biology and project it into the past. Because whatever the first cell was like, it was a lot simpler than what we see today. Okay, well, there, there you have it. I mean, uh, Paul Nelson explains this uh, very well there. He covers many of the points that I covered in the lecture, and I just wanted to uh, show that video to demonstrate, to help you understand why life from non-life by natural chance processes is impossible. So if it's so obvious that it's impossible, Secular science agrees they have no explanation for how it could possibly happen. Where did the information come from, for example? How do you explain information? Richard Dawkins, when he's asked that question, has, has no clue where the information came from. So what do these scientists say? Well, here's an example. A, a George Whitesed, a chemist at Harvard University, recently came up with this statement. He said, the origin of life, this problem is one of the big ones in science. It begins to place life in us in the universe. Most chemists believe, as I do, that life emerged spontaneously from mixtures of molecules in the prebiotic earth. How? I have no idea. So, Uh, sorry. So uh, here, uh, revisiting this question, chance, necessity, or design, if you look at uh, these four examples, scratches on the cave wall on the top left, uh, how do they happen? Did somebody scratch the surface of those rocks? Did rocks fall from the ceiling in the cave, and that's how they came to be? Well, one could argue one way or the other, I suppose, but if you look at the the uh, carvings on the wall in the cave here below, you'll see uh, horses, pigs, cattle, 
uh, carved in the wall there. Can that be explained by chance? I don't think so. So if those things cannot, those simple things cannot be explained by chance, what about the human genome with three billion base pairs? Is there any way to explain that by chance? Well, as you've seen in the lecture notes here, there's just no way to explain that. It can't be changed by random chance processes, it can't be explained by a law of nature, and it can only be ex explained by intelligent mind. That's how they came to be, designed by an intelligent mind. So what do the evolutionists say about that? And let me just read two examples. Richard Dawkins, who is a well-known atheist and biologist from Oxford University, has this to say, biology is a study of complicated things that have the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Appearance. He won't admit that they are real. Second, Francis Crick, co-discoverer of DNA. Even he says, biology must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. So they're not basing their conclusions on the evidence that is shown. They have made up their mind and cannot consider the facts that are so real and true. So we summarize then, life by random chance, natural processes is impossible. Why do we say that? The four things that we just covered. The law of biogenesis has never been falsified. Forming components of life, uh, experiments have been tried. Miller isn't the only one, others have tried as well. But in, and the Miller experiment failed for the simple example that it was designed, first of all, as an experiment, it wasn't really the natural environment, and yet it produced the wrong amino acids. And the third, the mathematical probability of all the, the possibly the molecules in a primordial soup coming together by chance. We now know that mathematically that it is not just improbable, it is impossible. And then fourth, which is the big thing, and of course we have to recognize that um, uh, Darwin had no idea of the complexity of the information in the cell. He never even knew about the cell. He just thought living material contained of blobs which are just reproduced, replicated. No, there's intelligence involved. There's information. Information requires an intelligent agent or an intelligent mind to produce. We know this from practice and uh, there's no way around it. So for those four reasons, we conclude that evolution can't even get started. And the word evolution I use there uh, loosely possibly, but I'm, I'm referring to macroevolution, which is Darwinian evolution. The evolution described in Bar Darwin's book, Origin of Species, just can't even get started because this so-called possible primordial soup, you just can't form life from non-living components in that. So with that, I bring this to conclusion, and just to uh, note that this lecture is one of a four-part series um, I show where I refute evolution overall of those three stages, the origin of the universe, the origin of first life, the origin of complex life, they're all not supported by science. And then finally, I have another segment which talks about Darwin's doubt. Darwin, in his book, Origin of Species, had two chapters devoted to explaining if these things were not true, he knew that his, his uh, theory was not supported by the fossil record at the time. He thought maybe it would be in 100 plus years, but no. His doubts are real and have been proven to be real and has been shown, I think, conclusively that evolution is impossible. Thank you for your attention.